Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Bree Hogue and I'm the sales manager of Powell's Books here in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to follow our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Alex Ross in conversation with Daniel Zalewski. Alex Ross has been the music critic for The New Yorker since 1996. His first book, the international bestseller, The Rest is Noise, Listening to the, 20, in, Listening to the 20th Century, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and won a 2007 National Book Critics Circle Award. His second book, the essay collection, Listen to This, received an ASCAP Deems Taylor Award. He was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2008 and a Guggenheim Fellow in 2015. Alex's new book is titled Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. For better or worse, Richard Wagner is the most wildly influential figure in the history of music. Around 1900, the phenomenon known as Wagnerism saturated European and American culture. Anarchists, occultists, feminists, and gay rights pioneers saw him as a kindred spirit. Then Hitler incorporated Wagner into the soundtrack of Nazi Germany, and the co composer came to be defined by his ferocious anti-Semitism. For many, his name is now synonymous with artistic evil. A pandemonium of geniuses, madmen, charlatans, and prophets do battle over Wagner's many-sided legacy. In many ways, Wagnerism tells a tragic tale. An artist who might have rivaled Shakespeare in universal reach is undone by an ideology of hate. Joining Alex tonight in conversation is Daniel Zalewski. Daniel is the features director of The New Yorker. He has written numerous articles for the magazine, including profiles of Ian McEwan, Guillermo del Toro, and Werner Herzog. He edits Alex Ross's musical events column. This evening's event will include a question and answer period at the end of the conversation. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you would like to ask a question. You can support Alex and Powell's by purchasing a copy of Wagnerism at powells.com. A link to purchase the book will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Alex and Daniel, it's such a pleasure to wel welcome you both. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, Alex. Um, <laughs> this is not the first conversation we're having about this book, which uh, I believe I uh, gave uh, witness to its slow decade long birth uh, uh, over the past uh, 10 years. Um, you are um, a person with an amazing uh, ear, um, a great listener and appreciator of music, but you know, first and foremost, you're a writer. And <clears throat> this book in many ways is about how somebody who does one art form responds to someone in another art form. And I can't help but think that the fact that you, a writer who spends so much time trying to transform what it is in one medium, to transform music into words and to explain that to a different audience and to give it the shape, you know, to give the shape of narrative to review, even as you recognize the shape of narrative in music, that that is part of what interests you um, about Wagner's impact in the world? Because you know there have been many books about how Wagner may have in, you know, in, influenced uh, Debussy or other composers, but this is a book that's fundamentally about how a musician and a composer influence people who are not composers. Yeah, um, absolutely. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's the, the core of the whole project. Um, um, first of all, I just want to say it's wonderful to be at this uh, virtual event. I wish I were there in person because Powell's is absolutely one of my favorite bookstores uh, in the world. Um, and it's wonderful to be talking to Daniel. Uh, uh, you were just uh, integral, pivotal to my uh, existence as a writer and have been for quite a long time now, uh, 17 years or so. Um, but yeah, I think this whole this whole project uh, and just you know a lot of what I do as a writer goes back to you know, my, my childhood and sort of growing up with music and loving music and, and being so immersed in it and feeling this kind of gulf between music and, you know, everything else um, in in culture and, and in society. Um, and, you know, that always puzzled me. You know, I always had this urge to kind of bridge uh, that gap. 
Um, and, and sort of that was how I started out as a, as a journalistic writer after college, uh, uh, writing about, uh, starting really with contemporary classical music, but it was just this, this urge to make this link because so many people found the world of classical music, especially off-putting or mystifying or sort of, you know, otherwise uh, inaccessible. And for me, it seemed so natural. It was what I'd grown up with and was what my parents uh, listened to. And, and so I've always been looking for ways to, to link music to other art forms um, and to the sort of, you know, wider uh, social kind of political fabric. And it's also just because, you know, it's, I'm not just interested in music and I've always been uh, fascinated by the other art forms. And I went through a phase as a teenager in high school. I was very deeply into painting. Uh, I was painting these sort of strange kind of abstract um, things. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, I've been, uh, I've loved uh, writing and I ended up majoring in, in literature um, in, in college. And so this, this urge to, to sort of bring these sort of disparate art forms, you know, together under one umbrella is just it's just sort of a long running obsession of mine. And Wagner is sort of the, the ultimate case study, you know, of course, in the combining and the interaction of art forms. This was his ideal, the, the so-called Gesamtkunstwerk uh, ideal of, of reuniting uh, the art forms, which in his view had, had drifted apart and become too specialized. Um, and he wanted to restore the, the organic uh, unity of the arts uh, that uh, existed in ancient Greece, or, or so he perceived it. Um, and so that, that was his project. And then that was what, you know, in his wake, there was this incredible outward radiating uh, influence of Wagner on, on every art form in existence at that time, uh, all across the world, uh, this, this wave of reactions and responses uh, which came to be called Wagnerism. And so that's, that's what the book is about. But it is, you know, it is about Wagner. Wagner sort of, uh, you know, runs all the way through it. But in the end, it is about how art forms interact with each other and, and how painters and writers and choreographers and, and filmmakers listen to music. And I think it reveals, it reveals something about the music, which is fresh, sort of listening through their ears. And it also sort of casts new light on the work of those artists as we sort of adopt this kind of peculiar lens of Wagner through which to see all of them in succession. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Wagner was conscious of his effort to unify all these different art forms, you know, into, you know, from music and lighting and narrative and myth and, you know, his operas and things like that. Do you think it was actually his design to create this flowing river of influenced works across mediums? In other words, like, did he know that he was creating Wagnerism, not just his work? Like, was this actually part of the rather grand self-conception <laughs> of himself, that he not only was creating music that would influence other composers, but that he knew, wouldn't be, he wouldn't be surprised at all to know that Thomas Mann had written a novella called Tristan or something like that. Did, did yeah, yeah. he say precisely, that was what I was trying to do? That's a really interesting question. I've never quite kind of thought about it, um, whether all of this would have surprised him or not. Um, I think it would have to some extent, you know, because he was, I mean, he was fundamentally a man of the theater and he just he just wanted to sort of grab and sort of take hold of, of everything kind of out there in the world that, that, that he could sort of get his hands on, but, but sort of bring it into the theater and sort of create stage works that, that would be informed by all of these other artistic impulses but ultimately it was the stage that was the thing and i think there, there was something when I mean, he was somewhat monomaniacal in terms of he just he just used everything he just sort of soaked up uh, everything and he was he was a voracious reader um and and he was just sort of constantly uh uh absorbing or or filching perhaps you know ideas from so many different sources um the idea that it would sort of have the opposite effect and that it was sort of radiate outward. Um, I, I don't see much evidence that, that that was necessarily something that he that he planned for or expected. He did see the early stages of it, I think. You know, when when Baudelaire uh, mm -hmm. wrote his remarkable essay, Richard Wagner and Tannhäuser and Parents, um, in 1861, uh, in the wake of this huge scandal over uh, the performance of uh, Wagner's Tannhäuser at the Paris Opera, 
uh, Baudelaire had just been swept away by, by Wagner's music. First, uh, there was uh, orchestral concerts the previous year in, in Paris, and and uh, uh, Baudelaire wrote Wagner a letter saying, you know, how how utterly overwhelmed uh, he had been, um, and then he greatly expanded uh, on that that sensation of being overwhelmed in that in that essay, which really is kind of the 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 ground zero of Wagnerism as a phenomenon, because it's 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 the point at which you know, the meaning of Wagner's work is is really breaking free of his intentions and sort of taking on a life of its own. And so Wagner saw that, he read the essay. Um, there's actually two letters that he wrote to Baudelaire. It's quite interesting. The first the first letter uh, begins with something, something along the lines of, uh, uh, I read your uh, beautiful essay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and then he sort of immediately moves on to sort of this usual laundry list of all his problems and complaints and crises. Um, and I suspect that he had not actually read the essay at that point. This was just kind of this quick thank you note <laughs> that we sometimes write, you know, without having actually kind of, you know, absorbed what it is we're supposedly reacting to. And so he, he wrote a second letter, which is suddenly incredibly effusive and just kind of uh, overflowing with, 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 gratitude and, and, and so he, he wants to uh, he's been trying to find Baudelaire in Paris and, and you know thank him and and it's astonishing that that uh, uh, a foreigner had, had sort of so penetrated you know the world of his of his works and and I don't necessarily think that Wagner thought this is finally someone got it absolutely right in terms of the meaning <laughs> of the opera because it was Baudelaire it was it was you know very very strange it was very eccentric uh he was talking about uh uh, the, the counter religion uh, of you know the sort of satanic energies uh, in the in the opera and it was sort of very much filtered through Baudelaire's obsessions and, and preoccupations um, and it was just an extremely personal and and you know uh, uh, you know you could call it a, a misreading of of Wagner in certain ways you know certainly a very uh, certainly very um, uh, free uh, reading of the work. But Wagner was was delighted nonetheless, and so I think you know whether consciously or uncon unconsciously, he would have perceived in that moment that something was you know taking off here, and that his work was was sprouting in, in unexpected uh, climates. Um, and he didn't, he you know there's no sign that he objected to it. I mean he was so uh, fixed in a lot of his opinions about sort of what he was trying to say with his work, but but it did still get away from him, you know, in his own lifetime. It was sort of these, these different understandings were, were multiplying and he never really made a concerted effort to somehow, you know, put a stop to it. He tried to clarify matters, but he was so contradictory himself. And so all over the place in terms of what he was intending in, in the works that, that he didn't necessarily clear anything up when he, <laughs> when, when he continued uh, writing about it. <clears throat> well, it does seem like, um, you know, when you think about other people who didn't have this kind of, multifarious impact that there, you know, there could be an artist or a composer who, you know, would have a legion of fans, but there is more of a consensus about what the work means and what it means to them. You know, mm -hmm. so you have Baudelaire, you know, really keying into the sex aspects of Tristan Isolde and the Venusburg sections of Tannhauser and really, you know, seeing him as a kind of fellow traveler about sensuality or something like that. But mm -hmm. then you have other people who are, you know, kind of monkish spiritual people who like see in Wagner, you know, Parsifal as kind of like what uh, the work is all about. And so it seems like there is something not just um, that, Wagner was somebody who combined art forms and created things that were, in, you know, successful works that in, in inspired a legion of fans, but also the work is extremely weird and um, I don't know if you say contradictory, but like it does contain multiple themes that kind of engage in arguments with themselves that allow so many different kinds of responses or as your book says, misreadings to occur. I mean, in some ways your book is a kind of you know, very uh, enthusiastic anthology of these misreadings of Wagner and kind of dignifies the idea of the misreading as a kind of wonderful act in itself. Right, yeah. I mean, of course, this happens with every influential artist and, and artwork. You know, there's a multiplicity of readings and and uh, uh, the, the work is, is received in different ways, in different places, with different personalities. But somehow with Wagner, it's it's just all the more dramatic, this, this effect that sort of Everyone seems to see in the work, you know, what what they want to see in it or or predisposed to. So this kind of this this 
uh, uh, kind of mirror of the spectator in this heightened and you know intensified you know image of the self. And I think this has something to do with you know the the music itself does have this visceral impact. It it, it just sort of grips you um, with with a peculiar intensity. Um, but without necessarily being, you know, terribly specific about what these what these musical gestures mean, and and that's also heightened by Wagner's preoccupation with myth and with mythic archetypes, um, and these images of the cursed wanderer of the ocean, uh, the 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 man torn between uh, sacred and 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 sensual love, uh, Tristan and Isolde, it's sort of the love to the point of madness, uh, all of the archetypes of the ring, uh, the, the, the ring of ultimate power, uh, the magic sword, the, the, uh, the, the young hero discovering his powers, um, and uh, on to Parzival and, and the Holy Grail. So he was just brilliant at, at sort of tapping into these myths, none of which, of course, he actually invented. Um, and he, he modernized them. He, he gave them a new psychological richness. Uh, and he gave them this this musical texture, which uh, which just kind of projected them uh, so powerfully into the, the sort of you know cultural imagination of the period. And so everyone ends up seeing kind of um, themselves mirrored back. And and that is that's just so interesting, also because of the image of Wagner as this domineering and controlling figure. And and he certainly was, but. It is a definite quality of his of his work that 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 it tends to uh, multiply and 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 proliferate uh, in terms of its uh, possible meanings. You know the way Shakespeare has the, the ways that have, uh, uh, so many kind of Titanic figures of the past have, but but also with this incredibly intense argument. You know right from the start, there's these these battles over you know what does this work mean? Is it good? Is it bad? Who gets to possess it? Who to whom does it belong? Uh, that became a political argument. It became a kind of geographical argument. And Americans were saying, you know, no, only we have sort of truly understood Wagner. The French were saying the same thing. Russians uh, said the same thing. And, and uh, the left wing felt that, 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 that uh, Wagner uh, belonged to them. And of course, the, the right wing ultimately made a more persuasive argument. So this, it's a fascinating property. I'm not even sure how it how it happens, you know, but it, it did. It just, you know, Wagner just, just exploded in, in the, the cultural sphere of the late 19th century. Yeah. Um, given that he was, um, you know, initially, you know, creating work before the age of, you know, mechanical recordings and things like that, what, for someone to have had such kind of deep penetration into so many different realms of culture, it kind of makes you wonder a little bit, like, obviously there are people who would experience him first in this kind of pure way at an opera house, maybe at Boyrite itself. Um, but a lot of people seem to have, you know, had a kind of experience of Wagner kind of indirectly, you know, they kind of know the myths or the stories, or, I, you know, they're hearing a list transcription at a piano. Um, how did the music actually kind of penetrate um, and was it both his music and his ideas that was kind of, that were kind of spreading at the same time? Like how many people were being influenced by Wagner without the way that we would today in the age of Spotify being able to say, oh, I will, I've listened to Tristan 400 times in the past seven years or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. that, that experience is not what these initial kind of consumers who spread the cult experienced. Right, yeah. Um, that's a really interesting question because yeah, the, the of course, the, the, they were not electronically available, and even in terms of uh, being staged in opera houses, um, there were there were periods where uh, they were they were not easily accessible at all. In France, for example, you know, after that that uh, Tannhäuser uh, scandal, uh, Wagner's operas almost completely disappeared uh, from from French uh, stages for for decades, um, and there were there were enormous uh, uh, controversies when when people tried to start performing the operas again. So so yes, people were were absorbing Wagner through the essays, the prose writings. They were reading the librettos and sort of looking at the. the librettos purely as literary works. Uh, of course, Wagner wrote every word of the librettos himself. Um, and they would hear uh, uh, transcriptions. Um, they would hear uh, excerpts uh, at orchestral concerts. Uh, little cafe bands would be, would be playing Wagner. And uh, 
I suppose this is it, Wagner's ability to, uh, how would you put it, uh, diversify his brand or something, you know, just so that he was able to kind of market himself, you know, it's not, it wasn't simply music, it was also words and ideas and, and impressions. And, and there also sort of this, there was this kitsch Wagner merchandise and there, and there were etchings and, and paintings of characters from the operas being uh, distributed. So it was a whole kind of, you know, uh, uh, a platform of, um, of Wagneriana that was available. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating how, and even just sort of a little snippet of Wagner could, could seize someone's attention. I think of um, a particular French uh, a figure, a critic, uh, the critic Auguste de Gasparini, uh, who heard the wedding march from Lohengrin um, at a spa in Baden-Baden um, and reported that he was completely subjugated by the experience, uh, utterly <laughs> bowled over by uh, the wedding march, which of course we, is, it seems like the most innocuous uh, Wagner piece of all. And of course also the most familiar, having been heard it millions upon millions of weddings. But somehow at that moment uh, for Gasparini, it was this, this voice from another sphere it just opened up this entirely new dimension. So yeah, somehow when these pieces kind of insinuated themselves into the general cultural fabric, they, they would, stand out. I mean, I think of how, you know, how people in the 60s reacted the first time they heard a, a Bob Dylan song or, or, or a Beatles song. It was, it was different and it was charged uh, with something that, that just sort of compelled, you know, uh, further attention. So uh, that's a very interesting part of the phenomenon. In the book, I try to talk about not only the procession of kind of major cultural figures who are interacting with Wagner, but also this, this general social fabric and the, and the kind of, you know, cultural fabric and just these, you know, odds and ends of, of uh, Wagner penetrating the, uh, the imagination, which I, I could actually do a show and tell um, here. I have um, there are these sort of young adult um, Wagner books uh, that came out, uh, sort of young people. So uh, Wagner, uh, Wagner heroines and the tales of the Wagner uh, heroes. So, so, you know, wow. these, these stories would, would be sort of devoured by by kids or, or teenagers um, in, in the way that, you know, comic books are, are today, these, these kind of fables of, of uh, heroism. Uh, these, these stories were all very much kind of watered down and diluted and, and, and bulldozed <laughs> for the consumption. You know, you have to leave out the, the incest in, in the ring and some other uh, uh, troubling topics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, one thing that's, um, you know, interesting to read um, it's interesting to read Wagnerism in 2020, in part because the story it tells about um, sort of Wagner's uh, reputation through time. You know, the book isn't just a sort of ping pong series of different reactions. It kind of does show at the beginning of there's a period when the French and the Baudelaire's and the Mallarmé's kind of uphold him as kind of, you know, the icon of the avant-garde and the kind of avatar of these new and radical modes of thinking. And then we see, you know, over time, him become this figure and this icon of reactionary thought in, in Germany. And it, it's, 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 a, it's a narrative and it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of narrative that we see often nowadays with a lot of cultural figures, you know, people that we used to think, oh, you know, William Faulkner, daring modernist, now we think of, you know, oppressive figure of the patriarchy, you know, and th th there is um, both sometimes an unfairness to some of those narratives, but there's also in Wagner's case, a way in which it illuminated both sides of him. And so actually seeing both um, the sort of worshipful side, the, the side that sees the parts that are daring, and then the parts that, that, that you can um, highlight that are, you know, that are retrograde and that are even mm -hmm. sinister and evil. Um, they're all embodied in one story. But how, how, when you think of that arc, that narrative that takes him from Baudelaire to, um, you know, Goebbels being excited by him, how, how, how does that happen in your mind? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's very complex in terms of structuring the narrative, um, because of course that that story is unfolding uh, all through uh, the chronology of the book. And it's more or less a, a chronology proceeding from, from Wagner's death or even sort of loop back uh, to uh, 1848 uh, um, in the first chapter. Um, uh, and so on the one hand, I am um, bearing witness to this, um, 
incredible and you know sort of rather joyous uh, proliferation of all these Wagnerisms and all these unexpected and, and sort of wild uh, reactions and the and you know in in America and England and the occultists in, in France and and sort of the the, the decadent uh, avant-garde and uh, you, know, you know feminists and and uh, early gay rights activists and early modernists and so it seems to be the sort of Wagner's meaning seems to be just ever expanding. And that narrative actually goes on you know, all the way to the end of the book, because you know, even in the past several decades, uh, there have continued to be new inventions and reinventions of Wagner. But at the same time, there's also this, this other narrative, uh, which is one of, of ideological uh, narrowing. Um, and so at the beginning, Wagner's political meaning is, is much more to the left and, and, and really just sort of very broad. Um, uh, he's really not too politically defined at all in certain ways. Um, and then sort of as the 19th century goes on and sort of into the 20th century, the German conservative reactionary hypernationalist and uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, ideology uh, takes hold of Wagner ever more convincingly. Um, and that debate, that sort of fight over, over who gets Wagner uh, on the left or the right continues into the 1920s, sort of even, even beyond. Um, but it seems as though, you know, the, 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 the right wing uh, wins the argument and Wagner is monumentalized um, in Nazi Germany um, uh, as sort of the great progenitor. Um, and, and so weaving those narratives together is, it was very complex and I didn't want to, you know, I wanted both to be present and palpable. You know, I didn't want to lose track of of either side, and sort of, I was particularly concerned not to let my own kind of uh, enjoyment of 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 all these sort of diverse uh, alternative Wagnerisms to you know let me lose sight uh, of that of that other story, which just continues moving to the the forefront as the book goes along. Um, it's sort of certainly foreshadowed right at the beginning because you know when i'm describing the ramifications of wagner's death and sort of these worldwide uh, global uh, ceremonies of mourning i i take note of a of a student gathering in vienna a memorial for wagner which turned more or less into an anti-semitic demonstration uh, which caused a young member of one of those viennese uh, student fraternities to quit his organization and protest. Um, and that was Theodor Herzl, uh, who went on to, to uh, of course, write the, uh, the Jewish state and, and become a, sort of the founding force of, of uh, Zionism, the, the founding of, of, uh, of the Jewish state. But at the same time, he remained very much uh, uh, fond of, of Wagner's music. Um, and it wasn't necessarily a, a, a contradiction to him, but you know, so just even that one episode, you 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 see these contradictory strands kind of woven together. Um, and when the Nazi chapter arrives, um, I found as I was writing it, it was it was rather crushing, you know, having devoted years to the study of all these other Wagnerisms. To it was just so dismaying to see this happen. Uh, to this incredibly rich uh, uh, music uh, body of work, and of course to realize that, that Wagner participated um, in this process. Um, he was uh, to some degree responsible uh, for that employment of, of the work, even as there were important differences between his political ideas and, and those of the Nazis. Uh, nonetheless, it was not a it was not an irrational <laughs> uh, uh, development by by any means. There there is a logic uh, running from Wagner to Hitler. Uh, and so I hope I've done justice to that enormously complex uh, narrative, which we're sort of left with the, the, the wreckage of it uh, uh, today as we just continue trying to sort out what happened you know, with this composer. Um, it seems to me that one of the kind of implicit sort of uh, metaphors that guides you through the book is your own uh, kind of approach the ring cycle and at one point you kind of write that you know the good versus evil duality of the ring breaks down when Wagner makes the noble gods complicit in the general corruption and there's a sense in the book that in the same way that Wagner himself um, you know starts with these polarities but then begins to question both sides that your book as it does you know have 
quite deep and probing analyses of the way that Nazism um, uh, you know, co-opted Wagner, but also you know, embraced genuine qualities in the work, um, it doesn't cancel out all the other um, elements of Wagner's work that comes before. And that's sort of the, um, the, the kind of magnificent and kind of horrible qualities of a complex work of art that sort of demands and can take the challenge of being reinterpreted again and again and again. And you know, not every creator's output has that quality, but Wagner's does um, seem to call for continual reassessment and bears those reassessment. And um, I feel like the book in many ways is um, without um, really getting engaged with this whole question of sort of cancel culture or the idea of looking at people now with a kind of final and irreversible moral judgment. It is not asking to make a case for Wagner that wipes away his sins, but it is asking to look at him in the complex totality of his work going through time. And that that is in some ways, um, you know, uh, something that is a, a form of, uh, you know, richness and complexity that the ring cycle itself embodies. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it is it is not a work of, of good versus evil uh, by any means. Uh, there really is no clear villain um, in, in the work and, you know, uh, Alberic might seem destined to play that role, uh, the dwarf who, who takes the gold from the ring uh, from the Rhine and uses it to fashion the, uh, uh, the ring of, of power. Uh, uh, and yet he, he ends up being injured um, and, uh, and has a righteous complaint, as Wagner himself said, uh, against the gods because Wotan tricks him into giving up the ring uh, and, and the gold. And it is at that point that, that Albrecht delivers this, this rather magnificent, darkly magnificent curse. Um, and and it, is, it is a noble, uh, there's a nobility in that, and Wagner recognized that. And sort of Wotan, for all his grandeur and, and eloquence, uh, is a very troubling and, and deeply flawed uh, figure. I mean, if there, and if, I mean, it's hard to even sort of find uh, a hero uh, in the cycle, Siegfried, uh, the the sort of you know blonde uh, athletic uh, uh, hero you might expect uh, to to sort of uh, take over and, and ride and triumph uh, turns into a, a rather horrible uh, uh, grown up man in 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 Goethe Damerung, uh as he becomes enmeshed in these machinations of of Hagen and the and the the uh, uh, he becomes you know thoroughly unattractive. To the extent that he ever was attractive, I, I've never found Siegfried to be the most compelling uh, character in the whole cycle. And if, and if there is a, a, a hero or heroine, it is Brunhilde uh, at the end. But even she has her her moments of of uh, uh, delusion and and uh, deception. Um, and so it's it's just incredibly psychological psychologically complex. And if you're ever going to sort of take the ring and use it as an, uh, some kind of political allegory. Uh, you know, sort of us versus them. You're 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 going to have to distort, you know, some aspect of the story. Um, nonetheless, it does lend itself to that. I mean, there's no denying that sort of Siegfried did become this this blonde, you know, heroic uh, uh, figure in in German nationalist propaganda and and Nazi uh, propaganda, sort of divorced from from the complexity of the uh, of the story and 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 sort of so you can kind of you know take these sort of uh, mythic elements out and, and put them to use and, and Wagner lends himself to that. Uh, but when you put it all back together uh, in, in the work itself uh, and in all of its sort of interlocking pieces, um, it, is, it is extraordinarily complex and we're, we're never going to sort of put the final point on it in terms of, of understanding it. And yeah, the same goes for Wagner himself and the meaning of his work. And, and if, we just, if, we, if we pin Wagner to a particular ideology, if we say, Absolutely, Wagner is is equated with Nazism and Nazi ideology. Uh, you, you have to leave out a great deal of of the picture of of uh, his contradictory political beliefs, and you're also devaluing all of these other experiences. You're you're erasing Theodor Herzl's love of Wagner and, and W. E. B. Du Bois and Willa Cather and and, and all these other uh, figures, and and I think it's a it just sort of you know wipes out a great deal of history, and and with with this book, given how 
given how widespread um, the the picture of Wagner as Nazi is, you know, I just wanted to remind the reader uh, of of the richness of all, of all those other experiences, even as I show how that Wagner Nazi equation uh, came to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned Willa Cather, and um, it is true that you know some of this book is devoted to uh, sort of blustery males arguing over their you know opinions about Wagner and imposing it on you know, their, their new work in a kind of um, you know very showy and aggressive way. Um, Willa Cather is actually one of the artists who you whose work you explore uh, you know very deeply, and um, and you know really make a case that a lot of um, her both understanding of the you know, art form of singing, but that um, a lot of her um, female characters and a lot of her understanding of landscape is indebted to Wagner. So um, I know that she's a big favorite of yours. How do you see this kind of surprising um, alliance between the two of them? Yeah, well, this is, this is one of the aspects of the book that I love the most, just ha using Wagner and this topic Wagner as an, as an excuse <laughs> to uh, explore <laughs> body of work such as Willa Cather's uh, more deeply uh, to the extent that sometimes I would have, uh, I would sort of sort of burrow so deep into it that uh, I would have the material for a New Yorker article, <laughs> which wouldn't uh, necessarily overlap with, with the book uh, as I did with Willa Cather, as I did with Mallarmé. Um, and uh, and just sort of having this, you know, license to, uh, to uh, explore some you know, cultural territory, which which I, I knew to some extent, you know, uh, I, I had read some Willa Cather at the beginning of this project, but I just got ever deeper into it. And I went to Red Cloud, uh, where, where she grew up, or where she spent a lot of her childhood um, in Nebraska, I actually ended up going there three times, um, and uh, meeting, uh, you know, Cather scholars and, and people who, who, who live in, in that town and who are, you know, devoted to her and, and even some distant relatives uh, of, of Willa herself. And, and, and it became, I mean, I was, I was fairly determined that Cather would, would play a significant role from the outset, um, but I ended up devoting an entire chapter to Cather. And she's the only figure who does get a chapter all to herself. Um, and you're right, there's so many of the other chapters, it is the sort of maelstrom of, of debate of sort of people kind of fighting over over Wagner and attaching him to kind of one ideology or another sort of artistic agenda. With Cather, it seems simpler in a, in a sense. I mean, he, uh, she simply loved the music. Uh, she, she didn't have some great kind of ideological structure to attach to it. She simply absorbed it into her world, her, her very sophisticated and multi-layered uh, uh, world, which so often uh, is set you know on the on the nebraska plains but but has these resonances um and so just growing up there she she i think was one of the people who probably read about wagner before she heard wagner uh that's that's my sense it's, it's i don't really have the, the sort of evidence to back this up but my, my impression uh, circumstantially is that she she probably read one is uh, maybe a book like one of these you know tales of of Wagner, uh, or or sort of some you know introduction to to music, and, and just just the, simply the idea of of Wagner uh, uh, began to appeal to her in sort of the nature of these stories. But she would have also heard you know uh, the music on the piano, or or people sort of singing something from Wagner uh, at the piano, um, and and it just sort of took hold of her, and then and then she developed this deep love of opera, uh, uh, becoming acquainted with with uh, opera singers. And uh, Wagner was certainly not the only uh, uh, opera composer uh, whom she was interested in, but but she ended up fusing these these kind of Wagner archetypes with with her stories of the plains. So there's a series of female figures uh, in in Willa Cather who have a kind of Brunhilde uh, profile in a sense. Uh, and then most important, uh, and I spend you know a good part of the chapter on uh, The Song of the Lark, uh, which is uh, the biography, fictional biography of, of Wagner, a soprano who grows up in a town uh, very much like Red Cloud. Um, and it's a kind of oasis <laughs> in the book, I think. Uh, I did this in The Rest is Noise, too, to some extent. Uh, there, there are two chapters in The Rest is Noise that were uh, a little bit like oases amid the sort of general sort of free-for-all of, of um, 
stylistic uh, debate uh, and tumult. Uh, Sibelius um, and uh, Benjamin Britten. And so uh, Willa Ketter uh, plays the, the same role uh, in sort of you know, removing us from the, <laughs> from the melee for, for a little while. But that was, um, yeah, that was just a, a great experience and just sort of you know, going to Red Cloud and, and, and getting to know people there and, and looking at the archives. Uh, uh, it's just this gift you know, that, that is a project like this unexpectedly uh, sends your way. Absolutely. Um, well, here's a moment where I give you the uh, embarrassing confession that I think my first experience of Wagner uh, was through the Muppet movie in which um, <laughs> Kermit and Miss Piggy run together across the meadow and embrace. And I remember still being like, well, what is this music? And, you know, it, it taking a while before I finally figured out what it was. Um, a lot of, um, there's a chapter in, in this book that talks about, um, you know, for a lot of people today, you know, knowing kill the web, it kill the web, it is the way that we first kind of hear um, Wagner. And um, you, you, you are a huge, um, you know, movie lover yourself. Um, talk a little bit about Wagner's impact on the way that we experience movies. You know, you recently published an article in the magazine about this topic. And, you know, lots of people know that there's, um, you know, the Ride of the Valkyries has a prominent role in something like Apocalypse Now. But, you know, it, there is a way in which the very grammar of film has been deeply inscribed by not just um, individual stretches of Wagner music, but by his very approach to melody, to sound, to thematic signposting and the like. So um, what are your favorite, um, you know, movie sections that have um, been uh, infused by Wagner's work. Yeah, um, well, that was that was also a lot of fun <laughs> to spend. I spent a, there was a summer of just sort of watching one movie after another and going through uh, Wagner's very extensive IMDb listing, uh, which was up to around fourteen hundred uh, movies uh, the last time I checked and just sort of plucking out obscure titles and seeing if I could find them sort of somewhere on the internet or or uh, renting them from from wherever um, and sort of trying to sort of put together a, a narrative a sort of chronological narrative of, of Wagner not just in Hollywood but you know in, in world cinema and yeah it begins very very early I mean even before the movies existed I think the Wagner experience, especially at Bayreuth, was uh, sort of proto-cinematic, and, and a number of scholars and theorists have pointed this out, uh, Friedrich Kittler, uh, among others, that, you know, almost that Bayreuth is the first movie house. The lights go down, there's this uh, dramatically defined stage, uh, and, and Wagner had this double proscenium, uh, which was this, this frame that was designed to just completely focus uh, so Joe Biden here <laughs> focus the uh, 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 viewer uh, on the on the stage, blot out the rest of the theater. You're not supposed to be looking around and seeing you know whoever else is there. Uh, and there, he had sight lines. All the sight lines go directly to the stage. Um, and and so he he talked about it in terms of projection, like the projection of the picture. Uh, and the the orchestra is sunken. You don't see the orchestra. It's in this deep pit. And so the sound kind of wafts up and wafts around you like a soundtrack almost as if it's emanating from a, from a very sophisticated speaker system. Uh, so when the cinema, when movies actually start to happen, you know, um, it's almost as if sort of Wagner has, has prophesied uh, the experience. Uh, and then when, you, when music began to be applied to uh, film, you know, first uh, the silence, uh, not just kind of bits and pieces of Wagner's music, the Ride of the Valkyries and all his other kind of hit tunes, uh, but the idea of leitmotif was very influential and it was sort of stated uh, outright that this, this was going to be the model for, for how we put together mm -hmm. our film score. We use a leitmotif uh, system. Uh, and then the, the themes, you know, sort of Wagner themes, Wagner characters, uh, these, again, these mythic archetypes that start coming into uh, the cinema. And you have also people listening to Wagner you know, on screen uh, uh, or Wagner being played, you know, on screen. So it takes many different uh, varieties. And, and so it's great fun to watch all the different manifestations of it uh, from, you know, Fritz Lang's uh, Nibelungen uh, films, uh, uh, which are sort of saturated in, in Wagner, despite Lang's dislike of, of Wagner, uh, to sort of romantic episodes in Golden Age 
Hollywood um, in the war, Wagner becomes thematized both on the Nazi side and the, and the Allied side, you know, as, as war music. Um, you know, after the war, he starts being treated in a, in a very kind of surreal, uh, surrealistic way uh, by Bunuel and, and, and Fellini, uh, Ken Russell and, and, and various others. Um, and then the uh, climactic uh, uh, apocalypse now uh, scene, the stupendous uh, scene of the helicopter assault on the Vietnamese village with uh, the, the, the helicopter uh, pilots, um, the, the commander of the expedition, the, the Robert Duvall character, uh, blasting uh, Wagner as this kind of, you know, fantasy of, of uh, heroism uh, as, 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 this, as this mayhem is unleashed. Uh, and so, again, we're seeing Wagner all across the political spectrum. We're seeing him in Russia. Uh, one of my favorite Wagner scenes in on film is uh, Giga Vertov's three songs of Lenin, uh, and he, he stages this um, uh, the Lenin's funeral with Siegfried's funeral music uh, from Goethe Demerang, and it's, and it's an astonishing uh, cinematic uh, sequence and also chilling in various ways because you see Stalin lurking there and, and uh, uh, but you know that's a sign that you know Wagner was beloved of the, of the early early Soviet Union uh, as well um, but um, but they're sort of they're unexpected uh, sort of lesser known um, Wagner moments uh, as well one of my favorites is this this beautiful uh, film noir called Christmas Holiday uh, starring Deanna Durbin and, and Gene Kelly um uh passed somewhat against type as these sort of troubled or or in gene kelly's case quite sleazy uh film noir characters um but there's a scene in which these two kind of slightly lost young people meet at a concert at which um the uh, uh the Liebestote from from tristan is being played uh just just by the orchestra and it's this magnificent shot by uh, robert sionmack the emigre director uh, 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 directed the film, and the and the, the camera slowly pans from the uh, from the orchestra all the way across the auditorium, it's the old Philharmonic Auditorium in LA, up to these these two young people sitting, you know, way up in the upper gallery, the cheap seats. They don't know each other, and they and they start talking, you know, after the after the performance, and it's it's magnificent, and it's the kind of scene that 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 you see so often in literature as well. I mean, people were always using. Wagner performances as these moments where you know characters undergo some kind of transformation and they have some kind of revelation, or they might they might be um, become vulnerable. Uh, there's there's the whole series of scenes where a young woman is made vulnerable to a predatory male because she's listening to to Wagner and the sort of yeah, sensuality yeah. <laughs> sort of leaves her you know prey to that advance and that's actually kind of what happens to Diana Durbin <laughs> after that uh, after that performance but um but it's it's an old fashioned you know uh, Wagner scene uh, as I like to as I like to call it and uh, it's 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 just so beautifully filmed and it's so evocative of all, of all these themes that run through my book um <clears throat> I realize uh, uh it's time to ask some uh, questions from people in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a good question here in which um, you know, someone makes the point that you know, so often we um, are conditioned um, with Wagner to be um, discomfited by who he was as a person, his questionable political beliefs, his anti-Semitism. And the, the, the questioner asks, do you think that in the case of Wagner, the operas should be appreciated as works separate from Wagner the man? or are the two unable to be disconnected from each other? I don't think it's really possible to, to you know, completely disconnect you know, one's experience and understanding of, of Wagner uh, from this uh, very dark history or what becomes a, a very dark history. You, you, you can't ignore it, you can't forget about it. But at the same time, I think you can, you can have a, a very personal, uh, individual experience of the work, and you don't always have to think about Hitler when you're listening to Wagner. And in a way, that that gives Hitler too much power to let him possess uh, this composer for all time, uh, and sort of dismiss him on those grounds. I think it's it's uh, a tremendous loss, um, and it's kind of un 
an injustice. It, it gives it gives Wagner it gives Hitler too much power, um, and so I think we have we have every right to lose ourselves in the music at some point. And this and this happens to me, you know, routinely when I when I listen to Wagner because it is it is so intense, and it's not always certainly not always about grandiosity and 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 bombast. You know, there are extraordinary quiet moments in, in Wagner and sort of these, these moments of, of, of nuance and sort of, you know, sort of emotional uh, complexity and these, these twinges uh, uh, all through his work. And he was, he was incredibly detailed in terms of how he translates uh, emotion into music. And, he, and he's a great creator of characters too. I mean, whatever his faults as, uh, <clears throat> as a writer of the German language and, and those faults are, are substantial. Um, uh, it, he 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 was a great dramatist, and 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 these these characters, Brunhilde, Wotan, the Flying Dutchman, uh, Gernemans, and, and Parsifal, they are they they are just very very rich uh, psychological uh, creations, who are always changing, you know, from performance to performance, and that's that's another thing we have to we have to grant the performers the power mm -hmm. to remake uh, this music. It's not ever about just sort of Wagner's will being followed to the letter. Uh, it's, it's always being reshaped by whoever's singing, uh, whoever's conducting, who's ever playing. And of course, you know, how it's being staged and you never know what you're gonna get uh, with Wagner staging these days, especially in, in Europe. Um, and you're quite unlikely now. Uh, I mean, it's almost forbidden in Germany to stage Wagner with, with swords and spears and and you know helmets with the you know wings um it's 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 so often translated transplanted into some completely new sphere the director actually may directly confront you with uh the nazi uh heritage with the anti-semitism uh the way beckmesser is is portrayed now in, in productions of meistersinger um and and so the, the meaning is never fixed it's always changing and and we can we can find our own relationship with with this work we we have a kind of independence and and we're not you know there's there's nothing wrong with with sort of taking the work and and and, and reshaping it to our own ends and that's that's kind of what i found so fascinating throughout this book is how free especially kind of spectators of the late 19th century uh were just very brusque and kind of peremptory in terms of how they you know they just took hold of this of this work and they and they said this music is about the American West. Uh, this music is about uh, the the Catalan. You know, uh, it's, 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 it speaks exclusively to sort of uh, Catalans uh, or to the Irish or or to you know to whatever group. And and they felt this this sort of it was a very freewheeling kind of uh, relationship. And and now I think uh, we 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 tend to be almost sort of too imprisoned by what we know of the biography and the history and the, and the and the reception, so we, we should always sort of reserve that that right to, to be to be a bit more, you know, <laughs> liberal in, in in how we interpret the work. Sure. Um, here's another question: uh, What surprised you the most when writing about Wagner? Is there something you learned during writing the book that you didn't expect? Oh, they, I mean, there are many discoveries and kind of unexpected um, detours that that, that I went on. I mean, one, one wonderful discovery that I made, which I, I first presented in a, in a New Yorker piece in, in 2013, was the career of this almost completely forgotten singer named Lorana Aldrich, uh, who was the son, uh, the daughter of the, uh, of the great um, Shakespearean actor uh, Ira Aldrich, who was born in New York, and then he went to first to England, and then he had a, a uh, subsequent uh, European uh, career, and, and Wagner probably saw him uh, perform when he was in exile in Switzerland. Um, and his daughter uh, showed great promise as a as a contralto, uh, and was uh, singing, getting major engagements in in London uh, and other European houses. And then Cosima Wagner uh, cast her to sing one of the Valkyries in uh, in Bayreuth, which was remarkable that a, a mixed race singer. Um, was um, uh, was you know cast as 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 a Valkyrie, but Cosima uh, seemed to have no trouble with that. And so actually, I, I uncovered uh, the whole story—not the whole story, but but a lot more than had been known about her, including a, a letter from from Cosima Wagner to Lorana Aldrich. And uh, 
that just sort of came absolutely out of the blue. And, and uh, 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 I, I was able to, again, sort of spin off a sort of a whole, you know, New Yorker uh, article uh, from, from that material that I found and, and go into the life of her father, incredible story in itself, uh, almost none of which is in the book. Um, but uh, uh, there's a whole series of those of those uh, discoveries that I made, not just in terms of you know, adding something to the historical record, but just you know, personal discoveries, you know, coming to a deeper appreciation of Willa Cather or, or sort of going deeper into Virginia Woolf uh, or, or sort of this detour into um, uh, turn of the century Art Nouveau uh, uh, sort of Catalan uh, uh, architecture and, and, and poetry and, 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 and literature, which was, uh, went to Barcelona and happened to meet a couple of people who sort of, you know, unfolded uh, uh, that story for me. And, and I have to mention also so many amazing scholars and experts in various disciplines whom I reached out to, and, and they very generously uh, shared um, their their work. And and it's sort of it's this fascinating network of people who who specialize or have touched upon this curious field of Wagnerism. Uh, musicologists, but also art history people and literary scholars, and, and uh, all kind of converging in this this limbo <laughs> zone where kind of in you know under the umbrella of Wagner, everything kind of meets together. <clears throat> uh, and here I think will be uh, the final question. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, the question is, if you had to name an equivalent of Wagner in the world of literature, who would it be? And I guess there's two ways to think of that. There's one in terms of who is the, you know, who is the, the writer who created an enormous body of um, you know, works that respond to that work in other mediums, you know, and Shakespeare having inspired so many operas, or it could be you know, who is a literary figure who's both sort of glorious and satanic energies have been, um, you know, an object of heated discussion uh, in equal measure to the point that the debate, the furious debate never ends. Right. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, you know, Shakespeare immediately springs to mind as, uh, as an artist whose creations just seem to be endlessly replayed, reinvented, rediscovered, reshaped generation after generation becoming you know attached to you know every phase of 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 human history and and, and human culture in, in a way that obviously exceeds you know what has happened with with Wagner and something I say at the beginning of the book is that, that I felt that that Wagner actually had the potential to achieve that kind of Shakespearean universality and in artistic terms I think he he, he did achieve it to some extent but um, he was sort of pulled down uh, by his anti-Semitism, by, by the sort of darker uh, political strains, the, the, the extreme nationalism and, and chauvinism. And, and so he can never uh, uh, possess, at least for the you know, near future, it seems like, um, that, that, that universality, which, which Shakespeare has, has been sort of granted for all time. Partly owing, I think, to the fact that we know so little about Shakespeare, you know, I mean, maybe he was a tremendously nasty man uh, who had horrible opinions, but we just, you know, there's just so little that we, that we know about the, the biography of this person with Wagner, we know far too much, you know, I mean, I have the, uh, uh, the, the diaries of, of Cosima Wagner behind me on the shelf, the, the prose writings, uh, many, many volumes, um, and, and sort of at a certain stage in the later part of his life, everything that came out of his mouth was being uh, recorded. And, and so we, we know too much. Um, yeah, and then in terms of who, what, what, figure, what figure is troubled uh, and kind of uh, riven down the middle, kind of wounded um, uh, in the way Wagner is, I'm not sure. Um, does someone come to mind for you? I mean, I mean, in terms of Nazism, um, there are any number of writers who, who were appropriated by the Nazis or, or celebrated, uh, but you know, you can't really say that Goethe um, <clears throat> underwent uh, the kind of uh, the kind of uh, darkening of, of, of the reputation that that, um, that Wagner did. I mean, maybe it would be maybe it would be an American Elliot. author. Um, yeah, Eliot is is an interesting case. Um, Eliot is. In terms of anti-Semitism, I mean, Eliot is is shadowed by the anti-Semitism, and there it's sort of the the added 
insult that that he that he lived into the age of Nazism and and continued to make uh, anti-Semitic remarks. It just seems supremely galling. But that's that is that is how this um, obsession uh, uh, blinds you, you know. And this and this sort of this 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 bigotry is is something that that is just sort of so deep in you that you 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 simply can't let go of it and 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 for creative figures like Wagner and like Eliot as part of their creative process you know and that is that is what is so deeply dismaying is that it's sort of buried so deep that they, they can't seem to sort of function it, Wagner was was more severe of an anti-semite than than T.S. Eliot was but uh, but it is there on the surface of the work uh, in in Eliot in a way that you can't uh, look away from um, but Wagner is a, is a special case because he he is wedded for all time with essentially the the greatest crime in in human history um, uh, in in the in the Nazi period and and that can just never be never be forgotten um, but it can be more completely understood perhaps yeah well thank you Alex and thank you pals. Thank you so much. I'm on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you to both of you for joining us tonight. That was such a fascinating conversation um, and definitely something that has ties even to our political climate today. So it was really good to welcome both Alex Ross and Daniel Zalewski to Powell's Books tonight on our virtual event. The new book is Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. You can purchase a copy online at powells.com. Thank you, Alex and Daniel. Thank Have a good much. night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.